I'm part of the United States Special Forces, the Green Berets, and have been for several years now. In my tenure, I've deployed multiple times to Afghanistan, Iraq, a few months in Syria, several African countries. I've been to all four corners of the globe, and I've seen my fair share of the good, the bad, and the ugly that comes from being part of SOCOM. I've got plenty of stories, some more interesting than others, but almost all of them are heavily classified behind red tape that will never be declassified until I'm dead and gone. However, there was an incident a few nights ago that stuck out from all the others, mostly because one, unlike all of our other operations that took us the combat zones across the distant hemisphere, this one happened right at home in our own backyard. The enemies weren't a foreign proxy, a group of insurgents. It wasn't even human. Stuff from that night is still weird, and it's not like Command is going to give us any answers. It's the reason I'm bypassing everything I've been told, disregarding and putting my ass on the line, even if I use false information and withhold names. Plenty of innocent people have died. As you'll find out, an upper command would sooner bury it than acknowledge the deaths and give their families closure. I don't have all the answers of what happened in that Western Tennessee National Park, but I do have enough to let people know the truth. Semi-truth, anyways. For safety and privacy purposes, I stated previous, I'm withholding a lot of personal information, such as names, exact locations, and unit information, referring to smaller stuff that I don't think even the scary three-letter groups could really trace, even if they cared. I hope they don't. Like I said, I'm part of a SOCOM Green Beret A-Team. You all know who the Green Berets are. You should. My team is nicknamed Raider, a general theme in our company, naming things after warrior culture-esque terms. Raider, Artemis, Barbarian, Centurion, etc. It's a 10-man element. The team lead, a way too salty Georgian captain with a warrant officer, a medic, a comm sergeant, and six weapon sergeants. Our captain decided this way was best. Considering we're all in one piece after our last mission, he was right. Our weekend was calm and boring as we rotated on QRF, Quick Reaction Force, for the month. QRF means that if someone, somewhere, needs the green-eyed boogeymen of the Western world, we were ready to kit up and be there at a moment's notice. It just so happened, right when some of us were getting ready to head to the bar and have our two singular authorised beers of QRF month, we were called. When we raced back to our COP and got our stuff ready, the captain came with some surprising information. We'd be able to probably make it back for those beers, because we were heading to West Tennessee. Of all places. We didn't know what the status was yet. Command didn't give us any information, what the op for was, what weapons they had, what the layout of the area was. Nothing. But being QRF team, Raider still kitted up and we were at the HLZ in less than 20. While we waited for our transport, the captain finally got some information. Apparently, a facility in the middle of uninhabited, restricted woods of a national park had activated a distress signal. The woods it was situated in was a large national park in, like I said, Western Tennessee, with a long history of disappearances on its now frequently closed and blocked off trails and campsites. This raised a few questions. What was this facility? Why was it in a national park? What happened to need to roll out the angriest Green Beret team this side of the East Coast to act as its backup? Why were we going there when in an hour, someone in Libya or someone across Eurasia might need us to back them up? The captain acknowledged all of these questions, but assured us that's all he knew. He's been with our team for years now, several deployments to the box and back, and he's always been straight with us. It's how we knew he was lying. Our transport finally arrived. 160th Saw. Night Stalkers. An aviation unit that's been around for nearly 40 years, having dragged every single kind of SOCOM unit to every single part of the world. 
we expected the black orc they brought, but the armed escort of two birds that came with them was a surprise. We were in domestic America. We were going to Tennessee. Why were they here? Even with the Night Stalkers flying at top speed across several states, it still took a couple of hours to reach our landing point. The inside of that bird going full throttle was deafening, even with the electronic headsets we were sporting. It was ear-splitting. And yet, while sitting next to the captain, I could tell he was speaking to someone on a different frequency. This was off, because normally he'd go to the comm sergeant and have to use the radio, but he had a side channel filled in his radio, talking to someone, writing down incoming information. I was able to peek over and saw some of the things he was writing. Mascal, close quarters up four, no blue four on X. The birds touched down in the middle of an empty parking lot outside of the local ranger station. We filled out to the open area. The birds took off. The captain chimed in on our team net. Raider Romero, this is Raider Lead. Get on the net and have them hold orbit in case we need close air. Break. He then broke transmission and talked to us. All Raiders hold outside and take up security. I'm going to get the damn Ragnar. Prepare for a hasty ass ramp brief. I just got more information. We all took positions behind some of the parked vehicles the Rangers would use. Just to clear things up, our team was outfitted with GPNVG, also known as Quad Nods, four barreled night vision optics that provided an almost daytime like view of our surroundings. Couple that with our PEQs mounted on our rifles, allowing us to see and shoot anything at night. As the military says, we own the night. The tree line in front of us was lit up like a goddamn operator rave party as the captain walked back, nods down as the ranger currently on shift followed him. He keyed into our net and we could hear him through our headsets. All raiders, this is lead. New information states that the facility has suffered mascal, situation break. Mascal means mass casualties. Enemy Op 4 unidentified. However, outgoing net during distress call indicates that Op 4 is extremely dangerous and engages at close range. Break. There is no Blue 4 on site. I repeat, Main has stated there is no Blue 4 on site and we are to drop any and all packs we see. A few seconds passed as the captain looked back to the park ranger. Any additional comments, Ranger Clements? The man, maybe in his mid-forties, balding, he scratched the back of his neck, clearing his throat before speaking. I heard a lot of gunfire coming from down there, and don't split up. Whatever you do in these woods, don't split up. Ah, medic laughed. Well, that's just comforting. The captain nodded to the man as he held back in. Everyone watches sixes, twelves and fives. Let's go. We picked up and moved out. Everyone had their own kind of final moments type of readiness drill they did before they stepped onto the path into the woods. Same stuff we did, stepping off out of the FOBs and compounds back east. I let out one final breath of hot air in the cold. Our medic slapped the side of his helmet, hyping himself up. The captain pulled out and kissed a small crucifix necklace from underneath his combat shirt. We headed down the pathway, following the captain in a staggered column. Our IR lasers scanned the trees, rocks and foliage around us, looking desperately for any hostiles that lurked in the darkness. Though, to our paranoid readiness, nothing appeared. But, something was definitely following us. When we move through forest environments, you listen to the animals around you. The crickets, the birds, the movement of animals and what direction they're heading, how fast. Moving down that path, I couldn't hear a goddamn thing. It's common when you're a group of heavily armed green men moving through a forest at night that some of the squirrels and birds will run the hell away but not the crickets or the bird songs in the distance. There's a certain level of ambience that animals will maintain, even if they detect humans around. There was none of that. Nothing. Not a cricket 
a bird, a cicada, nothing. Silent professionals. It's in our name. So, when I could hear a friendly ten meters ahead of me breathing as we moved through that dead forest, it told me that something else was here in the woods with us, a predator, and that the forest was more afraid of it than us. After a long stretch of marching down the trail, the captain held a hand up, signaling a halt. As it got down to my part of the column, the middle section, he called over the radio. This is lead, on me, time now. We quickly rushed up to what we saw was a metal chain link fence. Four of our weapon sergeants and the medic took up security covering the wood line behind us as I and the other remaining one went up to the gate with the captain. The bark's trail carried on for a few more meters before stopping dead into some trees. The dirt path broke off and formed a gravel one that led into a sectioned off area behind a chain link fence and gate. A ah, no trespasser sign hung high and just beyond the gate we could see a small guard shack. The captain tried to signal whoever might be in there by switching on the surefire attack light on his rifle, shining it and lasso waving it all over the booth. However, Upon stopping and centering in the doorway, we saw a large amount of blood splashed on the back wall and pulled over the room, an arm laying halfway out the door frame. The captain looked to the other weapon sergeant with us. Get your kit. He nodded, slinging his rifle as he dropped his assault pack, digging out a small pair of bolt cutters. Each of our weapon sergeants carried a different loadout depending on what we needed. One could be a gunner, Another's a grenadier. I can't name him, but Breachman, as I guess I'll call him, always carried a breach kit, just in case. He walked over to the lock, but just as he got the blades of the cutter around the lock, we heard it. It sounded like it came from everywhere, and yet far away at the same time. Maybe it was the echo of the forest, or maybe something attributed to its abilities. It sounded like a woman, yelling in pain, in agony, and yet the voice was half gargled, like it was morphed with that of a dying animal, as it had an underlying low tone pitch beneath it. It got under the skin of everyone. Those pulling security immediately jumped, scanning left, right, up and down. Hell, even the medic, big stocky dude, grew up in Brooklyn, played football before he joined meaning he was as yoked as all hell when he got to our unit. The guy who once stuck his finger into a man's neck to plug his blood, looked around nervously. The hell was that? Our weapon sergeant with the M46 shook his head as he scanned the far off terrain, muttering in a low voice. Some horror movie nonsense right now. I remember holding my rifle's grip tight. Everyone was equally unnerved everyone, except the captain. He just told us to press on. For goodness sake, loosen your jock straps. let's go. He snapped the lock off. Immediately, the captain and I moved in and cleared the small booth, as two more weapon sergeants and our medic took up covering down the gravel road. It was a guard, no name tape or company logo, decked out in a black plate carrier, the plate carrier of which had been torn into as a large hole covered the entire area of his solar plexus, which was now fragmented and broken inside of his mulched upper body. No bullet entry or exit wounds, just a large stab wound that looks like he got ran through by a damn lamppost. My breath still got caught in my throat as I grunted to clear it. The captain stepped out of the small booth, spitting hard into the grass, shaking his head. The medic prodded him. What was it like? He grunted, walking to the front of our formation. Doesn't matter, Doc. We formed up and moved down the gravel road in a wedge column. The captain and the three weapon sergeants in the front wedge, the medic, me, and two other weapon sergeants in the back one, the comm sergeant in the middle. We entered the facility lot. Immediately, the comm sergeant linked up with the captain and I could hear him alerting Maine. This is Raider. Lead, we've reached the building. 
though it makes me wonder. If he used the comm sergeant's radio to reach our HQ, who was he talking to on that other channel? The lot was clear, and we got a good look at the facility. It was a grey concrete rectangle, maybe the size of a small gas station. Floodlights mounted on the bottom illuminated the gravel lot up to the dense, shadowy wood line that laid just beyond the chain link fence. The wood line that was still quiet. The masculine carnage we were told about was present outside of the building. Several guards, all in various states of mutilation, similar to the gate guard, were strewn about the gravel lot. However, unlike the gate guard, strangely, they were in heavier body armor, with rifles capable of going automatic and spin brass everywhere. Me and some of the other guys got on line and cleared out the back, exasperated breaths and muttering came from all of us. The captain chimed in. Raiders on me. Time now. We hauled ass back to him as we stacked up at the door. Flowing in, we were greeted to a lobby. Torn up, furniture thrown everywhere, impact marks from rounds hitting the concrete lined walls and ceiling. One dead guard slumped against a red stained part of the wall, the other in a crumpled heap. A woman at the desk, not a guard. Just a damn staff member sat back in a chair, her entire torso area torn apart. As we passed by her and headed through the double doors behind her, her empty, dead eyes met mine. The comm sergeant eyed her as well as we moved through the door. Sir, she was unarmed. I can see that. Keep chatter to a minimum. We cleared through the double doors to be greeted by a porcelain hallway leading into a set of stairs heading to a sublevel. The entire surface, ceiling, walls, floor was lined with ceramic white tiles. Ceramic white tiles that were like the rest of the scene so far. Stained with blood, guts, and even brain matter of the unlucky guards laid out all the way down the stairs. I counted eight. Seventeen so far. A flickering light could be seen through the wire glass windows of the double doors at the bottom. The captain ordered us to flow in through both sides. We did. Pushing in, we could see we entered into a T-style hallway. It gets a bit complicated here. Either end of the T ended, while the middle one shot forward far down into the hall leading into two reinforced blast doors at the very end. Two immediate labs on either side were reinforced with more wire glass, and despite several crates, impact marks, bullet holes, and even holes made in the glass, they held. This stuff can't be ballistic glass, our comm sergeant muttered. Why didn't they just take cover in there? The medic said. The captain sighed. Seems to be pointing to a surprise attack from the inside. Emphasis on surprise, jackass. The medic fired back. Well, sure, but it's just the door. While the hallways outside were a mess of blood, gore, guards thrown around, as they were ripped apart, creating a mess of bodies, weapons, and more spent brass, the lab techs had their white coats stained with their own blood. My blood, and I think everyone else's started to run cold as the pieces came together. Whatever killed them did so indiscriminately. We formed a rolling T heading into the hallway. I was on the right with the gunner taking center and another guy on the left. The captain pushed forward leading us from behind. The window labs ended halfway with two solid white doors near the double doors at the end on either side leading to closed off labs. The captain had us pull guard on both of the side doors as the gunner aimed back down the hallway. Everyone else took up security wherever it was needed. The captain eyed the door, feeling the cracks and lines of the blast door, looking for gaps that didn't exist. Blood had slowly leaked from the bottom, causing him to pick up his boots and eye it. And yet, no openings existed. An electronic pad was positioned on the right side of the door. The captain eyed it. It was a hand scanner. I didn't even think those actually existed. He jumped on the private frequency I keep mentioning. 
I'm at the doors. Yeah, at the far end. There's a hand scanner. He waited a few seconds of deafening silence. He made an internal chuckle as he walked over to the dead body of a guard, kicking its arm. Got one right here. I'm sorry, repeat last? Alive? He rubbed his face, cursing under his breath. Damn. He shook his head, turning on the white light of his rifle and scanning the corpses. This place is a goddamn slaughterhouse. How am I going- A crash emanated from the white lab door to the right of the blast doors. The one I was covering. Everyone paused for a second as the second weapon sergeant aimed his laser at it. The captain turned his head, aiming his laser at the door as he approached. Might have one, or might have up four. Wait, one, over. The captain formed up as the first man in the stack. An unusual practice, but everyone else fell behind. I was the second man. Two more made third and fourth. A weapon sergeant felt the edges of the door, then tried the handle. Locked. Him trying the handle must have alerted whatever was inside, because a voice bellowed out. I... I'm in here. Please, I'll let you in. Just don't shoot. The doorman looked at the captain, who nodded. Might have blue four inside. Stay sharp. Wait on me to fire. There wasn't supposed to be any blue four on sight. The door's electronic lock opened. The doorman grabbed the handle and pulled it open as the four of us entered the room. We pushed through. The captain hooked left. I pushed forward. The other two followed one of us respectively. Our lasers entered the room and a pair of hands emerging from behind a lab table. Please, the voice weakly shouted. The captain stormed over. Hands, now! I'll shoot you! I swear to God if you don't put your goddamn hands up! As the person stood up, he saw the hands were connected to a scientist, possibly late thirties, stringy hair with circular glasses, glasses that flew off when the captain closed the distance, shoving him against a metal cabinet, spittle flying from the bearded mouth behind the NVGs as he barked at him. ID, where is it? Show it! The captain began roughly searching the lab tech as he pulled out his ID. He grabbed it, shoving him to the weapon sergeant on his side of the room. The lab tech was kicked down to his knees. The captain jumped back on the frequency. I'm back. Possible blue four. Prepare for ID code. He read it off in phonetics before he got the response. He looked to the weapon sergeant guarding the lab tech. Get his ass up. Please, I don't know what's going on. I was just running some chemical tests. We've got to get out of here before... The captain got in the man's face. Shut up. He did. You know what you've been doing. I know what you've been doing out here. Open them doors now. The man was shocked as the captain continued. Open the damn doors now. With a point from the captain, the weapon sergeant shoved the man forward into the door frame. The man crumbled a little bit as the captain laughed. Take your sweet time, doctor. Let's go. I picked him up by his shirt collar and dragged him over to the blast doors. The captain pushed him out of my grip, shoving his face into the door. Hand on the scanner. Now! As the captain grabbed the man by his wrist, the lab tech struggled to get free. Please, I don't have access. I hurt my hand trying to hide. Let me go. The medic winced at the sight a bit. Uncharacteristically of a green beret, especially for a jaded as hell medic, he spoke up. Cap, come on. The captain just turned, staring daggers into the man as he wrestled from the man's wrist. Just wait till you'll see. I'm telling you. As the man struggled against the captain, the weapon sergeant came up from behind, shoving the man into the blast door, allowing the captain to easily place it on the scanner. The scanner lit up in a bright blue as several lines traced and looked over his handprint. It then flashed green as the electronic lock of the blast doors began to open up. The captain dropped the man. Well, goodness gracious, what do you know? The doors slowly pulled open. The room was dark. Red flashing emergency lights flashed all around as the sound of broken glass scraped against the door. 
a stream of murky blue liquid mixed in with the blood of several guards' bodies that were revealed as the doorway leaked out into the hall. The captain grabbed the lab tech by the collar, dragging him to his feet. You all know these men, doctor. Friends. The captain shoved him through the doorway, the lab tech slipping on the fluids and glass, cutting his right hand with a wince. We flowed in and... Jesus. I said this at the start. I've been all over. I've seen mass graves that terrorist cells have used in far off countries filled with entire villages worth of people. I've seen kill dens inside tunnel systems. This surpassed all of that. Every horror, every war crime, multiple times over. A series of glass tubes line the walls. Walls made out of monitors, hard drives and computer systems. The path of carnage led through the pile of guards at the doorway. That makes 24 armed personnel that were taken out by something. What really bothered me was that in those murky, green and blue glass tubes, as big as a refrigerator, connected to a port at the top and bottom, tubes and wires inside connecting to. The captain shoved the lab tech into a glass tube. The pop of the man's nose echoed off the empty area as he grabbed his nose. Well, Doc, which one was it? Which goddamn tube? Tube? What was he talking about? How did he know? Who was on the frequency? The lab tech spit out blood, leaking into his mouth as the captain, standing at six foot five, a giant, even amongst his team, brawny SOF operators, picked him up by his collar of his blue undershirt. I don't... Two weapon sergeants ducked out of the way as the captain got in his face, shoving him against the left side wall, causing the monitors and computer systems to beep and light up. Oh, you don't know, and yet your little hand opens the room that you didn't have access to. He roared, abandoning all silence and discretion now as the man began to sputter and sob. Please, please, I... I... The captain gritted his teeth. He quickly flipped up his nods and stared daggers into the man's soul. How many people did you snatch off that trail? How many? What kind of butchering you do to those kids before you stuck them in there? Which one escaped? Kids. Butchering. Something in my mind stopped and I switched on my rifle's tack light. A heavy pit in my stomach formed as I flashed it on the tubes. There were people in those tubes. They were people. Wire and tubes now poked into see-through and murky flesh as the bodies of the kidnapped floated, mutated, dissected and changed. One person's skin ran reptilian-like up their left arm before merging with a strange gaping hole in their chest, their skull protruding out of their skin in their head. My breathing stuttered a bit as I backed up a few steps glass crunching under my boots, curses muttered by the others in the room as we all began to look. Another one's mouth was sealed at the front, two more jagged, messed up sets of teeth poked out either side. Their eyes were sealed, skin covering defined sockets in their head. The medic flashed his on one where their spine stuck out through their back. The vertebrae was larger than a normal person's, the bones sticking out inches longer in some areas. Jesus, man, this is... He gagged a bit, coughing as he looked away. I had to pry my eyes away. My mind was frying just looking at... They better be dead. Oh, I swear to the Lord himself, if they ain't... The captain said sternly as the man sobbed and nodded. Y yes? The captain raised an eyebrow. You sure? Yes, they died during surgery. If you're lying to me, I swear to God, I will make you euthanize every single one. The captain shoved the lab tech forward into the center of the aisle. I looked down, shaking my head as the images of those things burned into the film of my brain. Where's she gone, doctor? The captain said, sternly, squaring up to the man, who sobbed as he shrugged. I, I... Where is it? The man continued to cry. 
he escaped. He killed everyone. He cut through the guards. He cut through everyone. All of my friends. This caused the captain to nearly bust the blood vessel from the look he gave him, balling up his fist and driving the arm and knuckle of his ugly glove into the gut of the lab tech. This caused the smaller, weaker lab tech to buckle over, dropping to his hands and knees, now favoring an injured hand and probably a burst spleen. Your friends? Your friends? You mean the friends that kidnapped a 22-year-old girl and a 14-year-old son and turned them into monsters? What about them? This earned only more sobs from the lab tech as the captain turned, hands on his hips as he scoffed. He looked at the medic, who only stared back through his nods. The captain turned to look at him. You got to the count of ten, and if you don't give me a single whereabouts of this thing, I will start grabbing tools and cutting your little Weasley ass up like you did to these kids. The captain loomed over the man, grabbing him by his hair. Sir, sir, please, the lab tech pleaded. One, two, three. The captain counted. Some looked away, others shook their heads. There wasn't a man in the room who wouldn't do what he did right now after seeing them. It's, it's in the woods. You heard it. It did its freaky yell just like 10 minutes ago. The captain laughed letting go of the man's hair as he whipped his head forward. Y'all hear that? It's in the woods. He pulled out his M17, his 9mm sidearm, pulling the slide back a bit to make sure it was chambered. Four. Five. Six. The man stood up, and at this point, I kicked out his extended leg, dropping him back to his knees. The man looked at me, then at the captain, you can't do this. This is illegal. Before the captain could finish his count, we heard it. It echoed all the way down the facility halls, reverberating off the glass tubes in the room. That half-feminine, half-monstrous cry. Except this time, it didn't come from far-off mountains or trees. It came from the stairs. Then the lights went out. I don't know if it was prior damage to the facility, or electric works, or something else, but they zapped out. The lights in the halls, the lights on the stairs, the lights in the room, the electronics, the lights in the tanks, all of it. He cried out again, and this time, I think I heard it say, help me. Anyone who had their nods up flicked them down, all of us trained our lasers down the dark hall beyond the door. The slight shakiness of all the green lasers told the same stories. All of the death, all of the stuff in the tanks, it had everyone spooked. The captain came up alongside me, and the medic, he looked back to the lab tech. You run, you die. The man swallowed and smothered his misery. I... I know. The captain corrected him in a low tone. No. You really don't. The creature cried out again. Help me. The sounds of something hard impacting the tile floor sounded out as it approached us through the dark abyss. More footsteps, then another cry. Help me. The gunner let out a shaky breath as he cracked his neck. More footsteps, then another cry. Help me. It was maybe five meters from the door now. Lord almighty, the captain muttered. I couldn't see much in that darkness then, but I saw what everyone else saw. I saw enough. Its body was easily six feet tall. Two gigantic, bony, mantis-like legs that were dark from blood stepped into the doorway. Its head was smooth, its large teeth shining in the darkness, and its eyes glowed like an animal. Its eyes glowed. It could see us. 
we all froze. We had rifles trained on it, a damn machine gun trained on it, a room full of green berets, the best of the best, and everyone froze. The captain was first to fire, slamming his trigger as he shot 223 death into that crime against existence. The gunner opened up as well, and then the medic. Two more weapon sergeants also shot. It yelled at us, cried out like an agonized woman pleading for help. Then, it lunged. Running and slamming through a test tube, glass flew everywhere, causing several of us to shield our faces as the water flooded the floor, and the deformed body that was inside flopped down near our feet. A horrendous, rotted smell filled the air. Jesus! The medic spotted out, gagging a bit as he kicked it away. The creature now screamed. As a rifleman that it jumped near backed up, it leapt on top of him, shoving that bony mandible into his left shoulder, pinning him to the ground as he screamed, thrashing his elbow into the thing as he kicked its stomach. But it didn't attack him. It just eyed the scientist. He attempted to run for his life, but the thing jumped on top of him, pinning him face first into the murky wet floor. That's when I noticed the six smaller, human-like arms on its torso. Its main mandible pinned him to the ground, the arms, some normal, some with bony spikes for fingers, others just lined with sharp teeth began to rip into the man's back. The lab tech screamed, his lab coat was torn open as he began to dig down into his back. Some still fired shots, but it didn't even react, it didn't even move just continued to tear into that vile but poor son of a gun. The captain's voice lit up the comms as he and the medic rushed to pick the man up and heave him on the captain's shoulders. We can't engage him here, outside, now. He was right. It thrived on close quarters. It ran guys through before they could pick it apart. We all ran, nerve shot weapons hot from firing into a thing that didn't react. The power off, so we couldn't close the blast doors. All we could do was run. I nearly slipped on the glass as we booked it out of there, firing some desperate pot shots into the lab with a gunner. The lab tech screams echoed throughout the hallway as we booked it up the stairs. It was gonna be done with him soon. The gunner and I covered the captain as we broke out into the open air. The smell of rotten death replaced by the open piney air of the forest. Several men broke out road flares, tossing them everywhere, giving us much needed light in the form of greens, blues, reds and purples. The captain dropped the man behind a beaten up and wrecked sedan as the medic began to patch him up. The gunner deployed his bipod and aimed at the doors of the facility from the car's hood. The captain positioned different men to where they could all fire on the door far enough away from the thing's grasp. Romero, get on that damn net and call in that air. I took aim behind a large SUV with several others. We all aimed at the door. The screaming had stopped. The silence was broken by its bony mandibles as it rushed out into the open air. And with all the flares and chem lights and even the captain's tack light, we finally got a good look. Its skin was a mix between pink from its exposed muscles to a see-through clear layer covering other parts. Bony, calcium-like armor had formed over a lot of its body, and its back to legs formed smaller, mandible-like features at the back. And its head, an exposed skull, all two human eyes peering out in a rage as its larger, unhinged jaw opened, and it roared out its deafening cry at us. The gunner was the first to open up. A blast of 556 tore through the armor on its mandible legs and torso. The thing recalled at first, and then hissed as it charged forward. The captain ran from his place in front of the sedan's side. The thing stuck its two large mandibles into the roof, badly denting it. The medic quickly covered the wounded weapon sergeant, shielding him as the thing peered down at the two. The captain quickly got his attention, aiming fire at the back of its head. It roared with a vengeance as it charged at the captain. He fell back to the sedan, running out of our line of fire as the thing barreled towards us. 
The thing stuck a mandible inside the hood, impaling it, and then another just to my left. I circled around and behind it as I fired. It cried out, blood now pouring from its wounds as its calcium plating was cracked and falling off in mass. The thing turned to me, and as I flicked my M4 to auto and laid into it, it just barreled at me, shoving me to the ground. Its smaller, demonic hands reached for me as I kicked them away. Its jaws snapped as I held my rifle in the way, shielding my face as it gnawed on the metal. The gunner then blasted a chunk of its exposed skull away, staggering it as it turned. The captain whipped his stock into the thing's head, then backpedaled as he fired off another burst of rounds. The thing turned at him, roaring viciously as the captain dropped his empty mag. He slapped in a fresh one as the thing lunged at him, both mandibles raised. The glass exploded out of the SUV's windows as the captain dropped levels, firing into its stomach as he circled out back into the open. The creature roared as it went to move for him again, but it couldn't. Its large mandibles were stuck all the way inside of the vehicle. The captain let his rifle hang slung on his front as he reached for something in his kit. An M67 fragmentation grenade. Get back! Everyone who was in the open ducked for cover. The gunner and several weapon sergeants retreated behind a series of concrete jersey barriers. I ran and slid behind the sedan, helping the medic to shield our wounded battle buddy. I heard the distinct sound of a spoon flying and the whistling of the grenade. The captain vaulted himself over the car hood with the comm sergeant, covering his radio operator's head as they both went prone. The explosion was thunderous. The shockwave of the grenade shook everyone and even rattled me a bit from being so close. Shrapnel and fragments flew everywhere, impacting the concrete barriers, the building, any windows in the sedan that weren't already broken were shattered. A few seconds passed as we all hesitantly started to lift our heads, then dropped them as the SUV's gas tank seemingly erupted and detonated, engulfing the wreck in a fireball so large it felt like the flames were touching my face. The captain popped up, aiming on top of the hood of the car, then I and several others joined him, peeking from behind our points of cover as we looked to see if that had done it. The SUV was a burning skeleton, an inferno from all of the ignited gasoline covering the frame and the ground around it, and the beast as it defiantly pulled its last remaining mandible, its front left one, the only appendage it had left, and stumbled out from the flames. Its skin popped, its muscles boiled, and with all of the see-through skin and bone plating torn and burnt off, it gazed around. Its eyes ruptured and melted. Help me. The gravel crunched as its charred and still burning body slumped forward. The captain emerged from behind the Vic as only a few of us dared to approach the thing. He lifted his nods, this time pulling his M17 back up and aiming at the thing's head. Three shots into the thing's head. The damaged and charred skull caving in. A circle of light illuminated us as the rotary blades of the Black Hawk sounded out overhead. I shouldered my face and lifted my nodes to avoid the spotlight blinding me. Up 4, actual down, building secure. The ensuing hour was one that was just shrouded in, I don't know, mystery I guess. The captain went against prior missions of telling us to go prone and pull security, putting the gunner at the sedan by the gate and telling the rest of us to watch the wood line. When the van showed up, that's when he told us to chill out. They weren't really vans, they were more like armoured trucks. Now, for the sake of being classified and remaining anonymous, I can't divulge a lot about them. I'm definitely not saying the black shirts were wearing black multicam combat uniforms with kits, weapons and gear available that would definitely make them a private sector group. I'm not saying their uniforms were sterilised with all patches, logos and markers stripped. I'm also not saying the hazmat suits looked way beyond anything our MOPE system has. I'm not saying they brought several metal cases in from their armoured vics, 
and I'm not saying they brought in advanced surveillance drones with them. I will say, they weren't really hostile. Damn, one even offered us a cigarette. The bird landed at the opposite side of the building, the open lot where they eventually told us to head. We prepared our guy for case vac on a litter with a black hawk and loaded up as the captain finished talking to some guy in a suit. He was much shorter, maybe 5'8". He bore the look of a younger, but still weathered man. His hair was slicked back and had a hard part. A slight bump underneath his sports coat told me he was armed. The captain eventually joined us as soon as the aviation crew shut the door. He popped his helmet off, much to their anger, and slumped back in his seat. When we touched base and got back to the COP, our sister team, Artemis, replaced us on QRF. I've been thinking about this for days now, about what those people did to them in that lab, what the captain said. They kidnapped them, cut them up, changed them. All for what? Some sick fantasy? Who even owned the lab? There were no US markings, no logos, zip. Like I said before, there's still a lot I don't know, but what I do know is that those guys got exactly what they deserved. That thing, crying out for help, pleading for us to make its suffering end. The more I think about it, the more it makes me sick. I don't know who the hell those guys were that relieved us, but they didn't have any markings. Some of them were speaking German, if my memory serves. But whoever they are, I hope they learn from their mistakes and never tamper with that evil again.